All right. I've pressed the record button. The stream appears to be happening. So let us discuss the power of the magnet in this pen. Dang. Let us discuss Unit 11, um, which is the first module in Chapter 8. So the whole module will be where to look for vulnerabilities in a host. That's what we'll tackle today. And then the next couple of uh, lectures will do how to exploit localhost vulnerabilities and then things you do post-exploitation. So generally speaking, that's uh, establishing some kind of persistence, covering tracks, um, depending on what your uh, engagement requires. Certainly if you're thinking about it from the perspective of a bad guy hacking into a system, they're definitely going to cover their tracks. They're definitely going to establish persistence. In certain pen testing scenarios, maybe you don't. Maybe you just get the, uh, you know, get the compromise, get a shell on a box and say, haha, we've, we have you now, and you know, write your report and collect your check. So we'll talk a little bit about the TCB, or the Trusted Computing Base. Thanks, Microsoft. How to find vulns in a computer, um, based on what it is and, and what OS it's working on and the tools you have to make that happen. About host exploits that require physical access. And generally speaking, like if you have physical access to a system and there do in fact exist uh, some kind of host exploit for it, you win. There's pretty much no, um, there's no system I'm aware of that is genuinely resistant to like an actual physical compromise. If I can touch it, I probably can compromise it. I guess with the exception of, I can at least denial of service it. I can't, you know, obviously like undo encryption, I suppose. And then how to find vulnerability specific to VMs and containers and how malware could know that it is inside of a VM or a container. There we have it. So the, the TCB or the trusted computing base is all the stuff built into your computer um, to form a foundation of security on that computer. Right, so all of the hardware, I mean, nowadays if you have a modern computer, it's got a UEFI in it, that UEFI does like cryptographic signing. It is aware of the types of firmware that are getting loaded. It's aware of the type of software that's um, getting loaded on top of that firmware. So you know, it starts at the hardware and bumps its way up. So all of those things, um, in their totality combined together, or what we're talking about when we talk about the, the TCB. So some of that is going to be the, the things that you set in um, the software security policies for it. Sometimes like the, the policies that are the written documents and sometimes the policies that get applied to specific systems. If you can impact any of that stuff, you can potentially compromise the security of the system. So if you have non-trusted components in a system, you don't want them to be able to talk to the systems um, and the components inside of the trusted computing base, um, if at all possible. If they must, there's, there should be some kind of policy that, that tells you, okay, it's fine if it, you know, this untrusted thing talks to this trusted thing, um, but, you know, we're going to be on high alert for that particular component. So if you've got some sort of system that needs to accept user input somewhere, um, obviously that those are not trusted components. Um, you need a definition of what it is we should be taking advantage of there so we don't wind up in like little Bobby Tables land where somebody's, you know, injecting, potentially like trying to inject code into places where there should only be data. So potentially operating systems can fail us um, and do. There's, you know, 
there is code running in the Linux kernel that is 100 years old at this point, and we're still finding vulnerabilities for it. Um, Windows has been around for forever, and you know, is even though Microsoft is making a solid concerted effort to secure all the things on Windows, is you still wind up in a place where you you get into trouble and have um, vulnerabilities that crop up. So. All of these places are places where we need to keep an eye on them. Um, insecure services and protocol configurations are a big problem. I've dragged you out to the PCI or the, the CIS um, workbench before. Is that ringing the bells? Here, it's a, uh, whenever we talk like configurations, I trot these guys out because they they provide um, they provide a bunch of benchmarks that you can use to make sure you're keeping up to date on you know whatever the most appropriate configurations for a particular system. In this case, Microsoft Windows Server 2012 R2 that explains all of the things. Um, that you should be keeping track of. So apparently there are 19 things that we think you should be keeping track of on a Windows 2012 server, starting with account policies and the enforce maximum password history to 24 or more passwords. Set the maximum age to 60 days or fewer. I actually disagree with this guidance now that I'm looking it over. Uh, master password age to one day or more, or the minimum. Minimum password must be reset. Complexity requirements. Sort of agree with that one. And then passwords and reverse encryption to disabled. That's a good one, for sure. And then like each of those, they talk about how to set that up. Why are we thinking it's like this? What impact does that have? How do we audit it? In this case drilled down right to like the um, the the computer configuration group policy that you would edit. So those types of documents help you avoid insecure protocol um, and service configurations. Insecure pretty much anything configurations, right? That was an insecure password configuration, although a debatable password recommendation. I think Microsoft's current guidance is don't set passwords that are more complicated than people can remember and don't make them change them until they're hacked. And obviously we've got other considerations here. Uh, if you've got applications, applications like operating systems need to be kept up to date. Um, web servers are you know, notorious for needing to be um, kept up to date. Those are applications that run on top of the operating system. On top of the web server, then you've usually got some kind of content management system that needs to be kept secure. Um, and that can include things like uh, PHP scripts or WordPress, which is always in the news. And then on top of, you know, so now you've got your operating system, and on top of your operating system is your web server, and on top of your web server is your, um, your web application. And then on top of that, like if, if your web application is, um, is WordPress, there are all these plugins for WordPress. So now you've got still another layer of complexity piled on top of that. So it's, there's a lot to unsafe applications above and beyond that. If you've got um, sandboxes, um, Troot, was this thing that tried to keep um, applications jailed inside of a directory. So you would run an application in a particular folder, and it would think that that folder was all of the directories on that computer. Um, those had a bunch of vulnerabilities, and people could escape those sandboxes. So if there are known sandbox escapes for things, those should get looked at. I hope by now you've got the importance of keeping things up to date. So maybe not the day of, particularly in a, um, in a mission-critical environment. 
I don't want to be the first person to install a, a Windows 10 for workstation patch on my system because if it breaks, like I have to jump through a lot of hoops to get my job done. But after a week or so, if I'm not hearing a bunch of complaining, um, I make sure that my updates get applied. And I think that's most of the sort of cautious businesses I've interacted with take that approach. You know, maybe we don't apply first thing Tuesday morning on Patch Tuesday, but eh, some businesses with a little more tolerance for risk, especially like user workstations, you know, Patch Wednesday is fine. Or maybe we wait a week and see if anything shakes out um, till the time after that. Account security, we kind of looked at one of the elements of that with that um, CSI uh, benchmarking document, right? So we want people to have secure passwords. Um, and how secure a password is, is debatable. And you need to, you know, the organization needs to be thinking seriously about what your threat model is. So, uh, you know, my, uh, my granny's little black book of passwords that she's got all of her passwords written down in uh, to make them complicated. Yeah. You know, what's her threat model? Is somebody breaking into her house and stealing that little black book? Probably not a big deal. A bigger problem for most folks is like password reuse since then you have every hacker on the internet to be worried about. Folks sharing passwords is a problem. Uh, I know back in the 90s, it was perfectly acceptable to have like an administrative password used on every system in an organization. We're, we're past that now. That's, that's not a good thing. Uh, but I do recall it. Um, we definitely don't want default accounts. We definitely don't want people to make um, file permissions too loosey-goosey. Sometimes that's a real policy um, nightmare. The last malware um, ransomware uh, event I, I worked on, the problem was that the administrative assistant who ran the malware had been given excessive permissions to all of the stuff her boss needed her to look at. So she essentially had access to, you know, pretty much the, the crown jewels of the organization because she looked at it for her uh, manager, which was a problem. Not a ton you can do when a kernel exploit um, rears its ugly head. In Linux, you can, you know, apply the latest kernel patches when they come out. Um, it is, you know, just another why it's important to keep your password or your systems up to date. So kernel patches should come along um, with about the same regularity as other operating system patches. And then finally, physical security. Again, uh, we mentioned earlier that, that you certainly, at the very least, are in a position to provide a denial of service attack if you have physical access to something, and probably more than that. So if, if I can get into the server room, I probably can wreak havoc pulling out cords and stuff at the very least. Maybe more than that if I can, you know, stick one of those great uh, Hack 5 devices in some open port somewhere. So physical security can get you into trouble on a couple of dimensions. And then software security, just all the things I said about unsafe applications, those are going to be problems. So that's all those things. In terms of identifying those things, it um, can be a little more challenging. You want to make sure that, um, again, you've, you've taken a look at what is running on your network. So this is why I wanted you guys to go through the, the process of doing a vulnerability scan. You may discover that you're not running any services that you would be concerned about. That's a great place to find yourself. Or you might discover that, hey, there are things out there that I didn't know were on my network. If you're not keeping up to date with system patches, so if you have a Samsung phone from the 1990s that's still uh, alive and kicking on your network, potentially there could be outdated uh, system files on there that have a known vulnerability that will get you into trouble. So old systems make for easy exploits. 
Windows tends to be what your target will be if you are working on a pen test for any kind of corporate environment. So it is a, a thing you should be planning on uh, getting good with using. Their operating systems, if kept up to date, are relatively secure. If you know managed properly, can be can be pretty robust. The um, the the places people get into trouble is when they start um, sharing accounts or uh, when somebody gets on the network and starts listening, grabs a couple of hashes and starts um, passing that hash around. That can get you into trouble. Linux is G like generally running the internet these days. So any sort of public facing, web facing assets tend to be running Linux. If you've got any sort of IoT or embedded systems, um, they, they will run usually a scaled down version of Linux um, because it's free. So it's easy for um, IoT vendors to save a buck and grab the latest Linux kernel and, and work on it. Um, although the uh, extent to which those will be getting ongoing security updates is debatable. Um, BSD is similar to Linux, but not the same. Um, it lives by different licensing rules. There's a like a, a BSD license that is um, how they they tell you whether or not you're you know what your what your um, rights look like. The BSD license are permissive, but not exactly the same. But the idea is that they want to minimize the amount of uh, restrictions they have. But they're um, not exactly copyleft, so there's no share alike requirement on it. And there's a handful of those. The original BSD license. But it's a, it like to a user, it feels a lot like Linux. You know, they're they're both Unix-like variants. Mac OS, um, particularly in um, creative companies, uh, you will see uh, a lot of folks in love with uh, Macintosh systems and. Uh, so design firms and stuff like that will definitely have bunches and bunches of, of Macs around. We used them in broadcasting for edit systems um, right until Final Cut switched over and turned to garbage. They were very popular. They also have um, their own uh, server operating systems. And that's the back end that those Macs talked to in that kind of environment. Um, iOS and Android finally. Um, Android runs a, a Linux kernel. iOS and Mac OS actually allegedly take their lineage from BSD. So they started with the BSD software and built upon it to make them. And relatively robust and secure. If you've never looked under the hood of a Mac, I mean, there's a terminal in there. All of the all of your favorite Unix commands exist inside of there, so they're very much um, they're very much just Unix boxes under the hood with the uh, GUI. I'm not sure if the whole thing is supposed to be called Finder or not, but the uh, the the GUI layer that sits on top of it all is um, sort of their secret sauce. And then we were just talking about embedded systems, usually some kind of tiny little chip. So if you've got a Raspberry Pi or an Arduino or um, any of those little computer on a chip type of things, uh, you've got an idea of what we're talking about here. They're like usually little um, purpose built systems and, and specialized to do one thing. There are RTOSs or real time operating systems that are supposed to be um, either for mission critical or time sensitive things. I imagine once we finally all get our um, self driving cars, they'll have little RTOSs designed to prevent us from crashing into stuff uh, in individual components. And then, in terms of specialized devices, there's the embedded stuff we were talking about. 
you got your mobile phones. The things that provide network infrastructure, so if you've taken our Cisco classes, things like switches and routers and firewalls and uh, bridges and uh, what else? Load uh, balancers, stuff like that. And then the alphabet soup of uh, point of sale systems, although the other acronym people use POS for oftentimes is equally true of point of sale systems. Then Internet of Things. I'll make the obligatory joke that the S in IoT stands for security. Because <laughs> there's no S in IoT. Okay, and then um, SCADA and industrial control systems uh, are the, the things that make factories run is what's scary about them. So, um, S-C-A-D-A -A, um, systems are, are like supervisory control and data acquisition is that acronym. And they're scary because like um, there was that big hack of the, I think it was Saudi petroleum slash chemical processing plant. Um, where you can start playing with the knobs that control the chemicals, that gets a little scary. There was also that, um, it was a uh, water treatment plant. Did you hear about that one recently? Don't remember hearing about that one. It was, uh, this was not much of a hack. So, and it made it to ABC. But um, they had their wastewater treatment plant had TeamViewer running for ease of remote administration, and they weren't like Johnny on the spot with the credentials for their TeamViewer install. And uh, yeah, that's bad. And the the what the um, hacker tried to do was to turn up the lie, L Y E that they were dumping into the um, water to an un unsafe level, right? So no bueno. Uh, luckily there, in that case, there was backup for um, like what, there was, um, like a, there was a physical human that checked when it went past a certain level, but still, those are scary. So that's industrial control system, SCADA devices. Um, and in that case, it was just a Windows device that was controlling the industrial control system. So POS, um, you, it depends on the, like, the engagement for sure, but there will be like regulatory compliance, um, particularly PCI. Uh, DSS issues with point of sale systems like do they store data appropriately are credit card numbers encrypted if they're stored or stored at all so there's a bunch of those questions that need to be checked off on the checklist um, because the payment card industry don't play they 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 give serious serious fines um, for violations of PCI DSS and I'm curious how big now that I mention it PCI DSS fines. Fines vary from five thousand to a hundred thousand dollars per month until compliance. What were the biggest, biggest fines? I, like they've leveled some million dollar deals. Veronis, compliance and regulation. For example, Target said the total cost of their breach was $2 million, including $18 million in legal settlements. So it can get expensive. Also, uh, there was a pretty good Darknet Diaries about some card skimmer who um, was breaking into networks to uh, look up point of sale systems that you might want to check out. We talked about SCADA, ICS, monitoring some kind of industrial control, big, heavy, scary machines that you know do 
potentially deadly things. So factories, industrial plants, things that run the grid, all the pipelines. Talk to SCADA systems, um, which are the things generally like the sensors getting feedback from things, and then have some sort of distributed control system that's letting you like open the valves and dump the lye into the water and fun stuff like that. So, um, like, can cost lives is basically the important takeaway from that, right? Potentially, those those are the places where we jump the gap from like uh, non physical cyber attacks to cyber physical attacks that potentially can you know, like start wars. And those have been used by nation state actors like to turn off the lights in places like the Ukraine. So it is a, it is a legitimate thing to be concerned about. I have one of the uh, fellows who is on the, um, the local chapter of the B-Sides um, MySec group uh, does cyber defense for the grid and it keeps them up at night thinking about these things. So IoT, depending on your IoT, they, they usually use Wi-Fi to get online, but they can use other networking technologies to do it. So some use Ethernet, some might have cellular. Um, they Many of them, depending on what we're talking about, will have some sort of Bluetooth, uh, maybe a radio frequency beyond just the stuff that's in Wi-Fi, or maybe use some sort of infrared um, connection. They also will have the ability to do potentially NFC, RFID. Basically, if I can if I can stuff a chip into a gadget, it is potentially a thing that will exist inside of an IoT device. So particularly, like you would see NFC and RFID for inventory management systems that would be scanning tags as they go past. Um, Ant Plus, I've seen in a lot of like uh, health and fitness related devices, and Z Wave. Um, it's supposed to be l super low power, and therefore, like if you had a remote or a, um, some kind of sensor that was far away, they would be useful for that. They also do clever things like each sensor can act as a hub and a repeater, um, all of which you know increases the amount of signal, which increases the amount of attack surface, which means that you know potentially you can get into those devices via those non-standard protocols. Right, if it talks some kind of connection and you can get to that wired connection or that wireless connection, uh, you potentially have an opportunity to to uh, break into something. So in addition to like just smashing things and turning them off or being able to you know type on the keyboard, although if you lock your screens, that's less of a problem, um, you also need to be worried about cold boot attacks and sometimes literally freezing cold boot attacks, and JTAG attacks if you have a system that um, actually does that. What are the difference between a cold boot and a freezing? Or is that just a joke? Glad you asked. Um, there was a... Uh, uh, so a cold boot attack where you're trying to, to get a memory dump out of something, and then there's really cold boot attacks where they cryogenically freeze RAM. And one of my professors over at um, Purdue, uh, this was her friend's research, literally dropping RAM chips into nitric, um, uh, what is it, not nitric, I was gonna say nitric acid, that would do the exact opposite of what we're trying to do here, into um, liquid nitrogen, right? So super cold, uh, RAMs are basically like little capacitors that just discharge really fast, and they do that slower if they're super cold. So, so like a regular cold boot attack is like some kind of side channel um, that's that's trying to get into the memory buffers to read what's in there, All right? So that would be more like like you've got physical access and you get a memory dump out of the RAM. Um, Ideally, what you're after here is encryption keys sitting inside of 
the RAM. Although there's now, um, because of the, so I've, I've been talking about this for a while and, and I finally bothered to look into it. There are ways to encode, um, you can encode data in, you can encrypt rather, data in RAM if you're willing to take a, the companies that do this allege that it's not that big of a performance hit, but some form of a performance hit. Um, because certain mathematical operations can be done to encoded encrypted data without knowing what's inside of the data. So I think you can add and multiply into RAM buffers and by doing just, you know, if you can add, you can create adder gates, you can you can do all the things. Um, so you can you can do all the things on encoded memory without knowing what's in there, which is an interesting programming challenge, I'm sure. <clears throat> so, but normally the way it works is you've got like your operating system's um, decryption key sitting in RAM, and you would you would go through and like if you've got physical access to the machine, um, you could potentially real quick slap another operating system in there and read out all of the contents of the slowly decaying away memory. Which actually um, SSDs are essentially the same thing. They're, they're basically, except they're designed to for that memory to decay very slowly. Why they're not an ideal solution for long-term storage. Oh, so the, so potentially you could get to that, or you pull the RAM out and you throw it into liquid nitrogen, and then hopefully you've got longer to get to it. If you have a uh, system with a JTAG port on it, the Joint Test Action Group port. We should have a picture of that. Uh, you may become familiar with these because you wanted to hack your Xbox 360 or something. Let's see some images. So like, one of those little guys on your uh, on your system, They're like pretty common across manufacturers. So you can get in there and potentially backdoor a system. Again, the, the super physical attack is like you. Not only do you need the system, but then you need to take it back to your JTAG reader and start goofing around with it. Although I guess I could imagine some, you know, like like. like uh, Mission Impossible scenario where somebody's like jacked into the JTAG in the back of the data center. Exciting music playing in the background while they're doing it kind of thing. So potentially a way to backdoor something, a way to get into, um, even if it doesn't have like a console port on the back of it, um, you may be able to tear it apart and get inside of it. Uh, there were, I've had students who uh, found this an uh, effective way to make their uh, video games uh, do things they weren't supposed to do. Finally, we should talk about virtualization. Um, you hope, and like this is a huge area of concern for data centers. So the virtualization we're doing in this class where you've got VirtualBox running and you've got these systems talking to each other, that's kind of a low level concern. Um, if one of those VMs manages to, to talk to the other VM. But if you think about, um, which is called a sandbox escape or a VM escape, if it can hop out of the virtual machine and into another one or into the hypervisor itself, it's off to the races. And like in, in our application, not such a big deal. But if your Amazon Web Services, you know, if one of my customers can get into my other customer's data, now we've got a big problem. So um, usually, um, like VMware and the other uh, virtual hypervisor manufacturers, Microsoft would be the other big one that I would. Um, immediately think of. They're usually very on the spot about patching those things, but those systems aren't like the world's easiest systems to update. So we have the um, 
lab at the college that if I go to update that hypervisor, you know, all seven bajillion of the computers that live on that thing need to come down. Ideally, they need to come down gracefully so that you can upgrade the hypervisor. So that's kind of a real, um, if anybody knows, let me know in the comments. If there is a better way to upgrade those um, systems, I'm all ears. Uh, but usually there's some hoops to be jumped through there because all the VMs have to come down. I suppose you could migrate them over to another host, do the upgrade, migrate them back. That sounds like a lot of work. Um, but there, man, it seems like there's got to be a better way. If uh, if you can't escape the sandbox, obviously like social engineering would be a great way to get to the uh, uh, systems. This term, VM sprawl, um, is is a legitimate thing. So the once upon a time, if we were going to spin up an ups, another server, you had to go to the store and buy one. Um, but with virtualization now, you know, if Jim in development wants a box to try out this, that, or the other thing, usually, you know, they submit a ticket, they build the server. I'll, if, you know, if, if, the, if we lived in an unfallen world, like that, that server would have documentation on it. That server would go on to the maintenance cycle, so it was getting regularly um, provided patches and updates. But th since it's so easy to make another server with virtualization, oftentimes it just happens and doesn't get well documented. And and the next thing you know, we've got this VM sprawl problem. So. You know, VMs are systems on networks that can be inventoried when you scan them. Um, if any of that stuff is ill-managed, so if the system that the VM lives on is not um, appropriately secured, if we migrate from one system to another and leave a copy of the machine lying around somewhere, um, if it doesn't get deprovisioned properly, so if we just turn it off and leave it sitting in our virtualization, all of those potentially um, run the risk of letting us access um, the, the data on the drive, the virtual drive itself, um, see our forensics class for details, or the contents of the RAM since you can, I don't know if you've ever done this, but in your virtualization, instead of choosing the um, shutdown option, let's see if I've got any of them that are actually in that state right now. So this system is not off as far as it's concerned. It thinks that it is uh, still running because I've suspended it. So VirtualBox and the other virtualization tools have the same functionality. VirtualBox has saved the system's RAM, all two gigs of it, into um, the hard disk of this system. And we could pull that back out virtual, uh, um, virtually. We could pull that back out and do forensic analysis on it. So the same kind of stuff we were talking about with a cold boot attack, where you like freeze the RAM chips and quick throw them into a system or, or boot them off of another operating system. Um, we've done the work for the hackers here by suspending that RAM to disk. And there's a bunch of other ways you can make that happen inside of Windows as well. A really nasty thing to do on an um, engagement would be to set a system up to um, do memory dumps and then force a core dump so it would write all the RAM to a dump file and then you could begin um, crawling through it looking for goodies like keys, like passwords, like the kind of things that live in RAM that you wouldn't want folks poking around at. So, Securing your VMs is a concern, and attacking them is the fun part. There's some giveaways um, for virtualization. So when you spin up a um, virtual machine, by default, um, it is going to use a MAC address for the network cards on that system that will um, be legitimate MAC addresses. Now you can just click this little button here and set it to be whatever you want. But by default, there'll be legitimate MAC addresses assigned to the virtualization vendor um, 
by the uh, authority who does that, which I want to say is Ayana, but I wouldn't swear to it right this second. That should be one of those factoids I have at the top of my head. Who? So each manufacturer gets their own um, series for the first half of it. So the device manufacturer burns that in, quote unquote. Um, yeah, the IEEE. Is that true? MAC addresses are formed according to the blah, blah, blah. Who hands them out? So anyway, you get that number. So VirtualBox has theirs. If you're trying to detect virtualization, a great place to start is looking to see if my MAC address was built by VMware. And if my MAC address was built by VMware, then we know what it is. So. Potentially, you can get around that. Um, you can play with that in the, the little dialogue I just showed you on VirtualBox. Um, you can replace the drivers to make them look unique. Um, the, the hardware parameters, quote unquote, cute, um, that the guest operating system sees can potentially be different than the host. So you can lie to it about what kind of processor it's got, that kind of thing. Um, and if you start digging into uh, memory, they will appear like as though they are at different locations in the actual RAM. So if you look at like, where's this, this um, memory exist on my the host machine and where do they exist on the guest machine, the guest machine will, will show you its idea of where that RAM lives, but it is going to be a virtualized address inside of there. So if you're looking at like what model are my drivers for my network card or that sort of thing, all of those are, um, all of those are things that that are going to probably give away the fact that I'm looking at a virtual machine. And sort of the next level up in virtualization from virtualizing the entire operating system is virtualizing the applications on top of them. And that process is called containerization. And if you do some digging into Docker, they're one of the popular tools for containerizing an application. Um, and the idea is that your application is going to require all of these libraries and other software to make them go. But the operating system underneath isn't really that important. So if you package all of the things that are required to make the application go into a container, you bring all of those libraries along with you. So. Containers are a little more loosey-goosey than um, virtual machines. They're also younger technologies. So, you know, VMware has been around for 20, 30 years now. Um, Docker, less so. And so, I mean, it's less battle-tested than virtualizing the whole operating system. Since they're not separated by the, you know, hypervisor like in a virtual machine, we're sharing the same kernel. We're sharing the same physical machine as well. Um, so potentially, it's easier to escape a container than it is to escape um, a virtual machine and then potentially hit other containers and potentially the host machine running all of those things. And I think that's all I got to say about all of that. So our lab for this one will be detecting that virtualization. And I think, yeah, that is that. Questions, comments, concerns? I'm going to stop that.